The word Easter literally refers to the time of year in the spring when the days become longer than the nights. But for the person who knows Jesus Christ, Easter means a lot more than that. It means that even though Jesus died, salvation didn't. Even though Jesus was buried, hope wasn't. Because Jesus is alive. Easter means there is forgiveness for my failures, grace for my guilt, and mercy for my misery. Easter means that the pain and the silence of living in a Saturday world isn't purposeless and it isn't permanent. Easter means that I can't out the grace of God and I can't outrun the reach of God. It means that Jesus is King, light overcomes darkness, and justice will win, and brokenness will be broken. Easter means that the scars on the hands of Jesus are telling a story of victory, not defeat. And the same is true for me. It means that I am not alone, not ashamed, not forgotten, and not forsaken. It means that the rain and the storms and the wind and the waves of this world will not have the last word because my future is a resurrected body with the resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Easter means that I can join with a choir of saints and angels singing, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your song? Easter means that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for me. Easter means that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Hey, thank you for joining us today. What many know as Easter Sunday, but what we as believers celebrate as Resurrection Sunday. And why is that? Because Jesus is no longer in the grave. He has risen out of there, ascended on high, where he sits at the right hand of the Father at this very moment. I'm so happy and joyous to celebrate this day with you. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. If you want to start turning there in your Bibles, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And we're going to go through them, as we always do, in an, in an expositional format. We're going to go word by word, verse by verse, through the text and we're going to see what it is that the Lord has to say to us here in that scripture. Now, I'm going to give you a little background on the text as you are turning there. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And as he is writing to this church, he's writing to those that he has already spent time with. He has spent a little over a year and a half with them in person. This isn't just a church that was afar off that he didn't have any personal relationship with. This is a church that he knew personally that he had heavily invested in. He had spent time not just winning them to Jesus, helping them find Jesus, but learning how to follow Jesus. And some issues had began to arise in the church where they were. And now they are writing to Paul. And as we get towards the tail end of 1 Corinthians, we see that the Apostle Paul, he is writing back and he begins to answer questions in chapter 10. And as he goes through systematically in each chapter, he is answering a question that they had a concern about. In, in the things that they were dealing with there in their church. And then he gets towards the tail end of the book and he begins to talk to them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now understand that Corinth was a Greek city and the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. When Paul had preached at Athens and declared the fact that Christ did indeed resurrect from the grave, some of his listeners actually laughed at him. Acts chapter 17, verse 32, detail for us that, that they laughed at him. This wasn't a situation where uh, he was speaking publicly and they kind of laughed under their breath. This is an outward laugh, openly laughing at him at the notion that someone could resurrect from the dead. Now, uh, many of the Greek philosophers consider the human body a prison. They looked at it that this is what you have, and when it dies, it dies, and, and that's it. That is the end of your existence. They welcomed death and deliverance from its bondage because they were no longer bonded in the body because it had died. And we see that the gospel in which Paul is sharing and has shared to them here in the city of Corinth contradicted many of the Greek philosophers of that time. And so now he is writing, and he's writing to spear note on the, the main focus of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in which we are celebrating here today. Now we're going to start in verse 1, I'll read down through verse 11, and then we're going to look at three different proofs that the Apostle Paul gives that Jesus did indeed 
resurrect from the dead. Let's start in verse 1 together. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Whew, there's some strong words. For I delivered to you as of first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to the one ultimate, the, to the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Whew, that'll preach this morning. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any other of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was, in, that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. He's reminding them of the gospel in which he has already shared to them, and he does this in a systematic process. And, and that's what I want to look at this morning. Number one, let's look at proof number one, their salvation. He starts right there in verse one. He says, now I remind you brothers. He calls them brothers. He doesn't call them friends. He doesn't call them co-workers. He doesn't say you there that are in the city of Corinth. He calls them brothers, denoting that these are fellow brothers in Jesus Christ. They have been adopted into God's family. What is he reminding them of? The gospel I preached to you, which you received. He didn't just share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. They received it. They heard it. They identified of the need in which they had in their depravity. They were sinners in need of grace, and therefore they received it. In which you stand. He's saying today you even still call yourself a Christian. You go to church. You do the things that, that are illustrated that we should do as Christians and followers of Jesus Christ. Verse number two, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So he's calling them out. Which is it? Either you believed in vain or you didn't. Either you are a Christian or you aren't. And he's denoting this under several qualifying statements, which I want to look at a little bit more in detail. Now, Paul had come to Corinth and preached the message of the gospel. And their faith had transformed their life. They had put their faith in Jesus. But an integral part of the gospel message is the fact that Jesus did indeed resurrect from the dead. Now, culture can often condition us to a way that is not godlike. Our culture has a lot to do with why we do the things we do and how we do the things in which we do. Now, we have to remember, because this was a Greek city, this was a city that was not religious by nature. It was a city that was being transformed through different ideologies mainly different philosophers and people of the day. And because they so frowned upon the resurrection, because they so looked at it in a laughing manner, that began to rub off on Christians in a negative way. They started to question their faith. Now, there's going to be things that happen in our everyday lives that drive us to a place to where we sometimes question our faith. Well, why is this happening if God is all loving? Why do we have a pandemic that is going throughout this entire world right now, if God is all loving? That's a great question, but that's a question for a different time. We understand under the sovereignty of God, all things do work together for those that love God according to his purpose. And in this time and in this season, it's giving us Christians a great opportunity to shine his light in darkness. And so he's writing here into these people to remind them who they are and what they believe, and where they have put their trust and their faith, and to, to uh, energize them to continue to do that. But pointing distinctly to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, after all, a dead Savior cannot save anybody. If Jesus is still dead, if he is still in the grave, how is he set apart from any other person that has ever lived? There's been many great men and women who have, have lived and died throughout history, but Jesus is set apart by the resurrection. See, Jesus really did live. He really did perform miracles. He really did things throughout his ministry that no other person has ever done before his existence and since it. And he really did die. But he really was resurrected from the dead. 
Paul is pointing to this very moment, saying Jesus is not dead. He is not in the grave. He is up out of the grave. He has resurrected from that tomb. That tomb could not hold him. Paul's readers had received the word, trust that Christ, been saved, and were now standing on the word as assurance of their salvation. He was emphasizing that in their life. Remember, remember what it is that God has done in your life. It is easy to lose hope, lose faith, and lose focus. But remember what God has already done in your life. Paul's saying, remember the Christ in whom you called out to, whom saved you and has been transforming your life. That same Christ who was alive and well the day you called upon his name is still alive and well today. Christ is not in the grave. Because the world gets a little bit darker and because we go through pandemics and trials and tribulations, that does not mean that God is dead. God is alive and well. He is still in heaven. He is at the right hand of the throne at this very moment. And that's something that we celebrate. And, and brother, sister, that is not something we should celebrate just today or once a year and a holiday. That's something we should celebrate every day of our lives. Not just when times are good, not just... And, and when times are rough and bad, but all of the time, being consistent in season and out of season, I remember what God has done in my life. I know what God has done in my life and continues to do in my life. I remember who I was before I came to know Jesus, and I know who I am today after I have found Jesus. I remember what life was like as a, a depraved young man seeking out in the world and, and embracing everything it had to offer, feasting upon uh, different things such as drugs and, and, and the pursuit of money in which I thought would bring happiness and knowing where all these roads led me in my life and feeling utterly hopeless and empty. And you may be watching from wherever you're sitting today and saying, I feel like that. I feel isolated. I've quarantined myself in this home. I've quarantined myself from the world. I have searched out throughout my life for everything this world has to offer, whether it was money or stature or fame or a relationship, thinking that these things would bring me happiness. And when I didn't find it there, I, I began to seek it in other avenues, such as drugs or alcohol or, or pharmaceuticals, realizing that that left me worse off. And I'm at a place in my life today where, where I don't know where to go. I've been at that place in my life. I've been at a place where in my life I had such great pain, I just wanted the pain to end. And I started to contemplate suicide. I know what it's like to run to the end of your rope and thinking, there is nowhere to go from here, so I might as, might as well end my life. I remember laying on my bed on that night and looking at my ceiling and thinking, is there really a God? Does God really exist? And if he really does, does he even know who I am? Does he even care about me? Does he care about the things I'm going through and the things that, that, that I'm struggling with in my life? And I remember calling out to God and asking God to reveal himself to me and saying, if you are who you say you are, if you really exist, if you are all loving, if you really do care about me, show me, reveal yourself to me. And the next day, I woke up to a knock on my door by a local youth pastor who invited me to a church that preached the word of God and said, yes, Jesus is who he says he is. He loves you so much that he came to this earth to live a perfect life, to die a horrible death, to be buried away in a tomb. But guess what? Three days later, he raised up out of that tomb, conquering not just sin on the cross, but death itself. And he hung around for a little bit and he centered on high. God is for you. God's not against you. God's not mad at you. He's mad about you. So much so that he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And I remember hearing those words and sitting in the back row of that church and thinking, I, I, they just don't understand. God can't save a person like me. I, 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 don't, I don't know that he could save me. I, I've done such horrible and wretched things as, as I began to process them throughout the night. I realized that God's grace, his love, his mercy, and his blood cover all. That there is no sin in which God cannot forgive. 
And that night, sitting in a Wendy's parking lot in Aston, Pennsylvania, I sat in that parking spot, and I realized today's the day I am going to embrace God's goodness, His salvation in my life. And I called out to God to save me. I admitted my sin. And I believe Jesus is who He says He is, and I confess those sins to Him, and I asked Him to not just save me, but to change me. And He did. And from that moment on, my life has never been the same. Every drug addiction I had, everything I had gone through in my life, in a depraved sense, I thirst for no more. What I now long for was a relationship with God Almighty. And you may be watching this, and you may be amen and, and pumping your fist and saying, that is my testimony too. I know Jesus. Jesus has saved me, and he has changed me. But sometimes we come to a season in our life where we forget about those powerful moments where God took a wretched sinner, washed them clean, and gave them a new purpose and a focused hope in their life. And, and life has a way of making us busy and getting us distracted and forgetting about God. And as we get distracted, we get busy, we start to strain away from our relationship with God, and we start to come to places like we see the believers here in the Corinthian church where they've forgotten about their salvation, they've forgotten about their life change, and they're starting to think thoughts that are not from God. Brother, sister, I hope God reigns you back in this morning. I hope he, he pulls you back to his word and close to his heart to remind you the same God that saved you is the same God that is here today and that is for you and, and, and desires for you to continually move forward in your relationship with Him. The proof is there. The proof is, number one, in the salvation of the believers and those that have called upon the name of the Lord and trusted Him. Secondly, we sec see a second proof here that, that the Apostle Paul really dissects for us. In verses 3 and 4, he lists them out, and as he's speaking, he's saying, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and He that was raised, and on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and to the Twelve, and then it goes on with more Scriptures. Now, when He says, first of all, of first importance, this means this is the most important. This is the central thought and focus of this text. The gospel is the most important message the church has ever proclaimed, right? It's been talked about not just in the New Testament. It's not just a New Testament thing, but in the Old Testament. We have Old Testament prophecy that points towards the coming of the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who would take away the sins of the earth by laying his life down. And Paul reiterates that in both verses twice. He says, in accordance with the Scriptures. This isn't just something new that just started up. This isn't just some crazy, thoughtful cult that decided it was just going to start someday that's been born out of different ideologies. No, this had been talked about for thousands of years already. It had been prophesied about over 400 times, and every single one of those prophecies was fulfilled. And that's what Paul is, is pushing forward as evidence, but then he, he lays it out in four specific details, which I want to reference as historical data today that we don't just have to look at in a faith-based um, sense here scripturally, but we know historically through historical documents of things that happened. So let's look at those four things. Number one, Christ died. Yeah, that really happened, right? I guess we could take a, a sub-point before that. Christ really lived. He's a real person that was alive, that really did perform these miracles. We know that there are multitudes of people, tens of thousands of people that have openly testified that, yes, we know that Jesus Christ was a really person that we personally saw and knew that did these wondrous works. But even with that, we have to remember during the time in which Jesus was crucified, just outside of Jerusalem, at Golgotha, in a place where multitudes of people were coming in for Passover, they watched him die. Some would testify and say, oh, well, well, well no, you know, he, he didn't die. He was just beaten. He was just scourged by the, the, the cat of nine towels. He was mocked with the crown of thorns. He was marched naked through the city of Jerusalem before thousands and thousands of people bleeding out all over the street up till Golgotha, carrying a tree in the shape of a cross. He was nailed to that cross and he was hung on it for several hours in which multitudes of people saw him hanging on that cross. But no, he didn't die. 
It's foolishness when we look at the data historically to make that assumption. That Jesus, given all the data we have, went through all of that and yet survived it. Even though people looking on saw the, the spear thrust into his side and watched the blood and water mixture pour out and seen him taken off and seen him wrapped and put into the grave. Secondly, he was buried. He was buried away. Now, this was a political thing that was going on at the time. Jesus, because of the countless miracles in which he was doing, many of which that are depicted in the word of God, had lots of people interested in what was going on with his mistrial and ultimately his murder. And with this religious uprising, as the Romans considered it, they said, we're going to be prepared. We're going to be prepared for these religious fanatics that are going to be upset that their, their king is dead. And so we're going to make sure that he is, he's locked away. A, a man is offering his tomb. He's opened it up. We're, we are going to make sure that he is placed in that tomb. But not only is he going to be placed in the tomb, we are going to roll a huge stone in front of this tomb, so big so that it's going to take several men from a legion in the Roman army to go to, to place it there, and it would take a, a, another legion of men to basically move it. And then we're going to leave armed guard there as well. And we have the data that this took place in which he was placed into the tomb, he was locked in by a rock, and then he was guarded. And if you know the gospel story, if you know uh, what, the, what Resurrection Sunday is all about, you know, guess what? He didn't stay there. That leads me to my third sub-point here. He rose again. He rose up out of that grave. He, he, death couldn't hold him. He, he, he rose just as prophecy said he would. The stone was rolled away. And the very men that were guarding him testified that Jesus, whom they saw die, whom they saw buried, rose again. Man, that just, that gives me, gives me spiritual goosebumps this morning. And I hope it does you too. I, I pray that we never become desensitized to the reality that Jesus rose again. He rose from the dead. And that, this means many things for us. Just as Jesus conquered death and rose again, and the Bible tells us he loves us and he's for us, that means no matter what we are going through today, no matter what we have encountered, no matter what we feel in bondage to, Jesus can help us to rise again. That we can rise up from our circumstances by the power of God and, and, and move forward. That's exactly what Jesus did. He, he rose from the, the dead and he went out. And fourthly, he was seen. Many had seen him. Now, uh, not just the, the, the guards at the tomb. We know that there were several people that were eyewitnesses to him, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Now, Christ died for our sins as referenced here in the Scripture. This is actually a theolo theological explanation of the historical facts in which the Apostle Paul is illustrating there. He gives us these four historical facts, but he ties it in theologically to understand that Jesus is set apart. He was set apart in his life and how he lived. He was set apart in his death and how he died. He was even set apart in that time and how he was buried, but he is certainly set apart in how he is risen again. Now, this is a claim that no other person can ever make. We have to understand that many people were crucified by the Romans. Many, thousands and thousands. Some would even say millions. But only one victim ever died for the sins of the world. That was Jesus. And we know scripturally, Jesus didn't just die. He wasn't just murdered. Jesus, as he willingly marched himself up to Golgotha, and he got to the place of the crucifixion, he laid that cross down on the ground, and they, they turned to him to place him onto the cross. And the Bible tells us that he turned to them, and he said, no man taketh my life from me, I lay it down. Jesus laid his life down on that cross for the sins of the world. He was presenting himself as a sacrificial lamb that there, the atonement for sins may be had. And we know scripturally that that took place fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament that he drank the cup of God's wrath for all of mankind that we may be saved. Likewise, many died, but only one has risen again. Think of all those that have died. Many of us have lost loved ones, several loved ones, friends and family, 
of people that, that we know that have passed away in this, in this very trying time around the world right now. There are hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people that have passed away into eternity. Jesus is the only one to, to die and to rise again. And you know what? If a person lives and performs miracle, miracles, countless miracles, extraordinary miracles that no one else has ever done, my ear is going to be inclined to listen to that person given that they are set apart. But when a person rises from the dead under their own power and walks out of a grave and says, hey, I'm alive, I'm just inclined to believe that person. And I encourage you this morning, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you are not a believer and you don't know what to make of Jesus, I, I beseech you to go and to seek him out, to search him out, gather the data and to see what it is that it has to say about who Jesus is and, and make a, a better decision upon what it is that you're going to do with the life, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what that means to you. Firstly, we see here in the Scripture their salvation. Secondly, we see the historical data. But the third proof we see here is that Christ was seen by a multitude of, of eyewitnesses. These aren't people that just heard about Jesus' resurrection. These are people that eyewitnessed him. They saw him with their own eyes. Now, on the cross, Jesus was, was witnessed by, by a great number of people, unbelievers and believers alike, as he laid there dying for mankind's sins. But likewise, when he rose from the dead, he was seen by multitudes of people, unbelievers and believers alike, that he was alive again. These weren't just a handful of his disciples that said, oh, I saw Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, breaks it down for us right here. He, he gives us a, a chronological account. He says, Peter saw him. And so did his disciples collectively when they were in the upper room. Jesus went and met with them there. We know that Mary saw him beforehand when Jesus was on his way to Peter and the disciples. Uh, James, his half-brother, and the Lord saw him. Uh, it appeared to him. We know that... Um, Several of them interacted with Jesus and followed him for days thereafter. There were, the Apostle Paul tells us here, there were 500 plus brethren that all saw him at the same time. 500 plus people. Now, historically, we have data that 514 people, even while being oppressed by the Roman authorities, said, yes, I watched this man die and I've seen this man alive again. And that is not a small number in any time, but especially for that time. We have to remember that this is a Roman-controlled province where they were trying to squash religious rebellion. And you have people that are saying, listen, I don't know if you're going to kill me. I don't know what it is that you're going to do with my life, but I can't help but speak of the things that I have seen with my eyes. I watched this man die a horrible death. I saw him placed in the grave, but I have seen him alive and well again. I want to ask you this morning, do you see Jesus alive and well? Through what lens is it that you are looking at Jesus? How is Jesus working in and through your life? See, oftentimes when times are tough or when we become distant, we begin to change the lens in which we look through God at. Now, maybe you know God, but it's been a long time since you've spent time with God. And, and the longer you, you spend time away from God, guess what happens? The further you get, you get further and further and further away. And the further you get, the more you'll have to change that lens in how you see God. You know, maybe going from wearing eyeglasses, you have to break out the binoculars because he's become so distant to you. Maybe you're watching here this morning and say, you know what, I've heard about Jesus my whole life, but I've never truly looked at him through any lens whatsoever. Well, guess what? Pick up a magnifying glass and inspect him. Inspect him for everything he says he is and he represents and make a decision from that. Who is Jesus to me? Think of the, the apostles. Think of all these people who are testifying that Jesus rose from the dead. Think about what is going through their mind. Many believed that he was dead and he was gone and that was it. And great doubt had, had, had taken their hearts. And then Jesus rises again. He says, no, I'm alive. I am well. I am 
here. And we see how that radically changed their life from that moment on. And I want to encourage you, if you will examine Jesus and you will realize that he is alive and well and he is, he is here. And, and, and the moment you call out to him and you, and, and you go to spend time with him, he will respond. And he will, he, will, he will reveal himself to you for who he is. The Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world who takes away the sins of mankind. One that is unlike any other, who has been set above and beyond any other, who at this very moment is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, interceding for us. And if we will cry out to him, he will respond and he will save us and he will change us. And Christian, if, if, it's, if you've been saved and he has changed you again, come back to him. It may be a long time since you've been his witness, and maybe you're just his witness on Christmas and Easter. Let that change. Let today be the day that it changes, and you say, do you know what? I've, I've got a platform, and although I'm locked in my house, I'm not locked from the Internet, and I still have a platform where I can go and I can share the great message of the hope that I have in Jesus Christ that historical data supports, that the biblical te- uh, text reveals to us that Jesus is who he says he is. Not only do we have Peter and the disciples and James and, and 500 plus people and Mary, we, we have Paul's testimony here. And this is different because Paul wasn't a disciple of Jesus Christ. We know he was a Pharisee. He was a religious fanatic, but he viewed Christianity as a cult, as some weird uh, religious thing that had no place in that modern day and time. And so he said, do you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to eliminate this cult. And in Acts chapter 7, we see that he begins to do that. And he gathers people together and being funded by different authorities. He goes and he begins to kill Christians. And he starts with Stephen, where Stephen is stoned. And then as he heads on out from there to go and persecute other Christians, Jesus shows up and intercedes on Damascus Road and reveals himself to Paul. And Paul, though he becomes physically blind, becomes spiritually awake and clear. His physical eyes may have been closed, but his spiritual eyes were open. And ultimately, his physical eyes return to him, and he becomes an apostle. Why? Because he was saved. The evidence was before him. And he saw Jesus for who he is, alive, risen from the dead. And he he begins to preach here in verse 9. He says, For I am the least of all the apostles. I am unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He said, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. We spend so much time and energy in our lives trying to mold who we are going to become. But through the grace of God, we can become something greater than we've ever imagined. Greater than anything we have ever hoped. And that can be today for you. Today, you can look at Jesus. You can embrace him. And by the grace of God, you will become what you will become. You are what you are. And through a process known as sanctification, not just finding Jesus, but following him, not just meeting him, but continually spending time with him, you will come to a place in your life where you will grow in your relationship with him and you will become like the Apostle Paul and the disciples and all the other eyewitnesses. You will go and you will testify about what you've seen, about what you've heard, about what God has revealed to you. Not as some religious fanatic, but as one person who lived without hope, who has found hope. One person that has found eternal life, sharing it with those that are still seeking. So if you're watching today, I encourage you to, if you are searching out for for Christ, If you don't know what to make of Christ, please comment right here, right on the feed where it is going right now. Get in comment and and, and say, hey, I would like somebody to reach out to me and and to talk to me more about this Jesus in which you're preaching about. Or or if you don't feel comfortable doing it publicly, inbox us here on our page and say, hey, I would like somebody to reach out to me about Jesus and what I can make of Jesus and help me to inspect Jesus at a greater detail. But I feel through the gospel story knowing Jesus lived and died and buried, but was resurrected again. He's unlike any other person. I want you to help me to make sense of what I can do with that. Maybe, Christian, you're watching here today, and it's been a rough season for you, and you're processing a lot of different emotions right now. Process this emotion. Jesus is not in the grave. 
He is alive. He is well. He, he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is for us. He is not against us. And he cares about us. And you are not isolated from him. There's no place that you can go that will be in the absence of God Almighty. That today, God wants to be where you are. God's already initiated this relationship. You just need to continually respond to him and to do that today. We can sit here and complain. We can sit here and, and, and rhyme and reason all in the ways that, that our lives are bad. Or we can hold to the gospel truth that Jesus loves us. That, that Jesus is unlike any other person that has ever lived. And that he wants to do something with our lives moving forward. And to put the trust in that. If, uh, if you would allow me to pray for you this morning, I, I know we are not together here in God's sanctuary, but I want to pray for you in and where you are. And, uh, and I pray that, that although this Easter or Resurrection Sunday may be very unique to you, I pray that it's the greatest one that you've ever had because you've blocked out all this world's noise and you've essentially focused in your mind and your ears to God's voice. And that you are hearing him loud and clear more than ever before, and that today may be the day that you find Jesus and you begin to follow Jesus, or that you see Jesus, and even though it's from afar off, you come back to him where you once found him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we come before your heavenly throne. We come, Father, praising you, praising you for, for living a perfect life to die a horrible death, Lord, that, that in your resurrection... You have displayed your power over death, Lord, even eternally. And that if we will call upon your name, if we will admit that we are a sinner, if we believe in our hearts that you have done these things and we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, Lord. You will separate them as far as the east is from the west. And I pray, Father, that those watching today that need to do that would do that that they would call upon your name and, and that they wouldn't just live life in isolation, but they would realize that a, that a church is a family that you belong to and that they would become a part of our family here in a church or another church, Lord. I pray for the family of God, for those that are already Christians, that through circumstance, through culture, they would not drift from you. They would not be conditioned to a place of doubt but that they would be determined to fix their eyes upon you and that today they would be reminded of your awesome power over death and in the resurrection, Lord, just as you rose again, we all too can rise again from our circumstances, Lord. By your power, we, we claim that, Lord, that you would do that and that would be real in our lives. It is in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, if you haven't already, please like our, our feed this morning and get in comment and, and, and get connected. If you're not connected already, share this if it's been a blessing to you that hopefully it would, it would bless somebody else. And most importantly, stay healthy, stay safe, and enjoy today and God's goodness. We'll see you. Have a great week. God bless.